Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this month's QTech committee meeting. We'll be starting in just a few more minutes. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this month's QTech committee meeting. We're going to get started in just a few more minutes. Thank you. Hello, welcome to this monthly QTech committee meeting. We're going to get started in just a few more minutes. So please enjoy our marketing slide deck that's taking place and we'll talk to you all very shortly. Thank you. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for this month's QTech committee meeting. We are about to be at the top of the hour for today's session. So we're actually gonna go ahead and transition to our live slide deck. So I'll just give us a few minutes to transition.
Fantastic. Thank you all for joining us for this afternoon's QTech committee meeting. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. As we proceed with our agenda for today, we're going to first cover some webinar logistics. As previously stated, we when you join the session, you are in a listen only mode and are muted by default. So in order to participate in the interactive Q&A sessions via the telephone audio, you will need to ensure that you have entered your PIN number on the telephone if you're using that option. And just be wary of double muting potentially if you're using computer audio or the telephone audio. You can use a questions panel during the webinar as well to share any questions that you may have for our speakers today. And then of course, this session is being recorded for you to revisit after the fact. And thank you for participating with us this afternoon. This first slide here is really an introduction to you all. Welcome again and joining us as we discuss our QTech goals and objectives together during our monthly committee meeting. And if we go to the next slide, we'll actually take a look at a couple different items here in terms of our agenda. For our agenda today, we are going to have our quick welcome, which we just covered. The around the room question is actually part of another speaker's presentation from Dr. Tim Long. So during his class, our collaborative session, you'll have an opportunity to participate in the around the room virtual questions that we had in our marketing slide deck today. After our welcome, we're going to actually pass the floor to our special guest from Banyan Health Systems, who is going to discuss their CHC spotlight on a cervical cancer screening campaign, patient engagement campaign. After that, we'll pass the floor to Dr. Tim Long to review some of the class, our collaborative survey results from the EMR experience survey that took place last year, as well as review some of the guidebook um, things related to evidence-based strategies to help address some of the factors revealed in the survey data. After that, we'll hear from my colleague, Fred Ira, who will discuss the HRSA CHQR badges and provide some more additional insight on those. And then after that, we will do some quick announcements and wrap up for the session today. So without further ado, I'm actually going to pass the floor to Marcia Young from Banyan Health Systems, who will be presenting today on the Health Center Spotlight. Marcia, thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Marcia Young from Banyan Health Systems, and I am the VP of Operations. I am presenting on cervical can cancer screening success um, that we experienced over this past quarter, uh, representing our quality and our medical director. She was not able to attend. Um, so let's start by, um, I just want to shout out all the Banyan staff who really engaged during this past quarter. We realized we had this um, awesome challenge to increase this measure. And because of COVID last year, all the health centers, I'm sure we're not unique, struggled with this measure because we had to immediately go to telehealth. So patients weren't engaging, they weren't coming in our clinics. And we just did a hard push this last um, quarter to try to get this measure up. So what are the things that we've considered doing? We engaged our or um, care coordinators, we at Banyan, we have care coordinators assigned to each provider. And those coordinators work directly with these patients. We pulled our list from the practice analytics of all those patients or women who were part of that measure, who were missing a cervical pap. Before we, um, we, va we validated the report, that's the first thing we did. We assigned it to our women's health care coordinator who really understand this measure um, much better than our other care coordinators who are not as involved in women's health. So she went in and she validated the data that we pulled to make sure those women actually needed the PAP. We found instances where um, the PAP work was performed, but it was the data wasn't being recognized within the system because um, we experienced issues with the lab with the low code, and we have been working very hard to try to manually put those labs into the system so we can collect that data. So we cleaned up the information a lot so we could get a true picture of those women who really needed a pap smear. After we cleaned up the list, what we then did was assign um, different patients to different uh, care coordinators who their job was to outreach those patients, call them, text them, send uh, mailers to them to try to get them into our clinics. 
that was hard. However, we created a, an appointment type called pap smear, and those patients were, were booked on the provider's schedule with a pap smear appointment type. In addition to that, we conducted morning huddles with our clinical team, and all the providers were on those huddles as well as our frontline staff, our MAs, and we went over all the PAPs that were coming in that day. So the MAs would prepare the room ahead of time so the providers would be ready to perform the, the PAP and not dismiss it when the patient presents. So we found that one, adding care coordination who were focused only on those individuals that were within that clinical measure that needed the PAP helped a lot. Two, making sure the data that we pulled from the system was accurate really assisted us. And three, engaging everyone, our frontline staff, our care coordinators, our MAs and our providers. We found a lot that some of our providers um, weren't as comfortable doing PAPs um, if a patient walked in. So education, our medical director continuously um, coaching and reminding the providers that once a patient is here, try to get the PAP done. That along with all the support that the supportive staff gave allowed us to receive the success that we um, received during this period. We started out in the, in, the, in the third quarter of last year, we were at 36%. And the same time, for this quarter, we are at 46%. So we went up by 10%. Um, actually, no, we went up to, we're at 53%. So we went up by 17%. Our national average for 2020 is 51%, so we are ahead of the national average. The national Florida average is 56%, 56.9%, so we're very close to being um, at the national, the Florida average. So we're very proud of our achievement and our success, and we're continuously engaging our patients. Uh, we find that this method, we're going to try to employ it on all the measures that we, the other measures that we're failing at. But this was the first test run, and I believe the continuous engaging and coaching of staff and patients has really contributed to us, our success in bringing this measure up. And that's it. That's my presentation. I don't know if anybody have any questions. If you would like more information, please reach out to me at Banyan. But we, um, we're very proud of what we did. We also engaged HCN. HCN was very, very instrumental in assisting us with getting the reports we needed and providing additional coaching for providers. So thank you so much to Dr. Long and Fred for their help in all this, in our journey. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Marcia, for sharing your presentation on different strategies to help increase the numbers on cervical cancer screenings. We really appreciate that. Welcome. I'm going to go ahead and take some time to see if there's any questions within the chat. We can also unmute lines as well if anyone would prefer to ask their question verbally. I, I don't have a question, Stephanie, but I do have a comment. If I could just uh, have a second here. Absolutely. So I just want to congratulate Banyan once again on the success. And I, I want to just bring to light here, being that we're at QTech and we're talking about many different uh, topics here. This is a great example of doing quality improvement and, and taking on a project using the under the PCMH umbrella. Just through those those couple of slides that she presented, you know, there's a lot of different concepts and criteria under the PCMH umbrella that that Banyan incorporated uh, in order to to improve on that that particular measure. Uh, expanding of the of the care team to include the care coordination, bringing this into the huddles, which is another concept. Using that type of approach, doing that outreach to the patients, that's another uh, PCMH criteria. I just want to congratulate Banyan once again and all the, the staff on, on that particular uh, thing that they were able to accomplish. So great job, guys. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for sharing that, Fred. And I don't see any questions at the chat, and this time um, I have unmuted the lines if anyone would like to ask a question verbally. 
So I'll give a few seconds for that, but if we hear no other questions, we can proceed through the rest of our agenda today. Thank you so much, Marcia and the Banyan Health Systems team. Hearing no questions, I think we can proceed with our agenda. So right now we're gonna pass the floor to our Chief Clinical Officer, Dr. Tim Long, who's gonna walk us through some of the class, our collaborative survey results, how it ties back to QTEC, as well as a guidebook that was released by the class, our collaborative, that will be very helpful. So Dr. Long, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Hopefully the audio is okay, and you can hear me okay. There's quite a storm here at our office, so hopefully the the power and the lights and the internet will stay up. So we'll let's see. I also want to thank Marcia and the Banyan team for the presentation. We really are, are um, encouraging efforts like that. Any way that we can help um, with your quality teams to do focused quality projects, ideally if they're focused on UDS clinical measures, we'd really um, like to participate any way we can. We're always um, responsive and, and trying to get data with you and for you. Um, and then also help for ways in which we can improve um, the care team workflows. So more to come on that, and Fred's actually correct. A lot of it does fall under PCMH, but um, any quality metrics, um, our team is, is ready, willing, and able to work with you. So here, as you can see on the screen, and there's a lot of slides, I wanna preface this. I think um, Stephanie Smith did send out the slide deck also on your go-to webinar panel. Um, you can see and download um, the slides there also. Uh, there's a lot of slides in the slide deck. We are not gonna stop and comment on every um, slide. Uh, so some of them are just there for your reference for later because you may want to be sharing this information with your providers. So again, as Stephanie mentioned, you know, um, uh, I don't think I introduced myself. I'm uh, Timothy Long. I serve as the Chief Clinical Officer here at Health Trace Network. And one of our um, roles in the quality department is to engage clinicians uh, to advance quality and health information, to, using health information technology. So we have partnered here, as you can see on the slide, with an organization called CLASS. And CLASS, as you might be aware, is a national organization that um, they collect, they do surveys of people who are using health information technology. So you may have been a, um, a respondent in their questionnaires before. They talk to leaders in um, the EMR field, in the data aggregation field, anything with, with health and technology, and then they rate, um, let's say they rate EMRs um, um, on, in different ways. So that's called best in class um, is one example that they use. Um, and when people are uh, switching to different um, health information technology tools, they often will look at the class data um, to see where their product falls within other vendors of the same thing. So you might see all kinds of EMR vendors being rated by class. Then over the past several years, class has brought together um, mostly physicians from hospital-based practices and um, academic centers, and they're doing something called an ARCH collaborative. And through this ARCH collaborative, they use a tool to collect uh, data uh, from users, mostly physicians um, in their group, um, to identify ways in which uh, people are satisfied or dissatisfied by using whatever EMR they're on. And then through the ARCH collaborative, coming together a number of times throughout the year to identify ways in which we can improve not only the satisfaction of health information technology or whatever EMR the organization is using, but also to share some of the best practices. So that's what class is, and then specifically the subset of class called the ARCH Collaborative. And so on the next slide, um, I think you will see, um, this is the high level outcome. We're gonna come back to the slide at the very end um, of this part of the QTech meeting today. However, this is a slide, if, if, if you don't, learn anything else today or take anything else away, this is the one slide you wanna pull out of the deck. Um, and it really talks about the areas in which class through the ARCH Collaborative and the survey that they have done have identified um, ways in which users of health information technology can become successful users or masters of whatever EMR it is. So it doesn't, and there's things that they have identified through these surveys that is EMR agnostic. And most of that 
identifies come down to those three things. The user must have a strong user mastery, meaning they must understand whatever EMR they're on. Um, and if users um, continuously learn more efficient ways to use whatever tool they're on, they are have better satisfaction. Sounds intuitive, but um, there are people that you know like look at the class surveys and say, oh, the EMR, I don't know, let's take Epic, let's say. And uh, some people will say Epic's the best EMR. Some people in the same institution will say Epic is the worst EMR. So it, it is not the tool really that is the is better or not better. It is one's experience with that tool. And some of it comes down to a strong user mastery, meaning they know how to effectively and efficiently um, use whatever EMR they're on. Then another one is the EMR meets their unique needs. So um, has this EMR that I'm using or you're using, does it fit me as the, if, let's say I'm a podiatrist or I'm a dentist or I'm a, a women's health provider? Is the EMR useful as a tool in my practice? So that is one of the um, important, well, they, they call them pillars um, in the arts collaborative that is, is very important. And another area is the shared ownership. So the user must feel that they have the ability to, um, you could call it customize or personalize things in the EMR. So it might be flow sheets or different views. It's not changing the EMR and it's not building a different EMR, but each person has to feel some shared ownership in that. So it might be that they can have different, sometimes they're called dot phrases or templates or smart forms, whatever the EMR um, jargon or language is. But the user has to feel that they're being heard, that whoever is, is, is doing the training and whoever is continuously doing the optimization and building of the EMR and improving it, that they're incorporating their voice and, they, and then it's heard. And then, so those three areas are key in building successful users of whatever electronic medical record we're using. It doesn't matter necessarily which one we're using, it's that we're using the one we're on most effectively. And as most people know, many of the health centers um, within Health Choice Network's um, group of health centers are moving to a different EMR um, called EPIC. Um, so again, it's not going to solve all of our problems if we're on Athena One or if we're on Greenways Intergy. If users are poor users on those EMRs, unfortunately, they're going to be poor users on any EMR. So this is the opportunity and this is why we're talking about um, the class survey and the Arch Collaborative now, because we have some lead time to do some things um, and prep our users. And specifically, we're talking oftentimes about the providers, the, um, um, but it could be any user of the electronic medical record that we can make sure that they have all of the tools that they need and planning ahead that we budget time uh, for training time for optimization, personalization, and then we put that into our budgets when we create our annual community health center budgets every year. So I've said a lot on that slide, we're gonna come back because that is the most important one. And here um, is highlights the first time within the ARCH Collaborative, which again is a national group of literally hundreds of thousands of physicians are in this group. However, they are all academic centered tertiary care hospital based and some um, affiliated practices with those large systems there have has not been any involvement of any community health centers or specifically federally qualified community health centers within the arts collaborative and within this large um, survey uh, that class puts out through the arts collaborative so last year um, we decided um, to bring together networks across the country, so you'll see them here. So us here at Health Choice Network partnered with our very close partner called the Illinois um, Chicago, Chicago Alliance um, and their QTech grant, which they call PTech, um, came together and we thought we'd invite other larger networks across the country to come together to join into the ARCH Collaborative as a group so that our voices could be heard from the community health centers into this large national um, data sets of um, clinicians using electronic medical records. So here you can see Breakwater in Concert Care, 
the Iowa primary, uh, which is the Iowa Primary Care Association, the Hawaii Primary Care Association, Shan, which is in the Northeast, um, and then the um, Vermont, New Hampshire PCA. So these seven um, networks uh, came together, and then on the next slide, you'll see some high level participation. So there were 148 different health centers in 33 different states, collectively within this, just our community health center group of these seven networks on 20 different electronic medical records or EHRs. And then this fed into that larger collective of you know, 100,000 physicians um, within their ARCH collaborative. But it gave a different voice uh, to the class group um, where we expanded the type of survey um, respondents. So generally, as I said, it's physicians. However, we included everybody that wanted to take the survey at the Community Health Center last year. So I think on the next slide, you'll see um, some, of the, some of this data. Okay, so here, um, it ties directly to this meeting and to our QTech um, objectives through the objective A3, which is enhance the patient and provider experience. So part of the work that we do together as a group, not only in this QTech meeting, but then also at Health Choice Network, is to make sure that the patient and provider experience is as optimal as it is. So some of that is getting some um, data on that experience. So on the next slide, you will see, I believe, um, yeah, this is all an orientation to this slide deck. So we're gonna, this is for your information later if you wanna drill down into some of this. So I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but HCN, 20 means this is the breakout of our group of that larger um, subset. So let's go through, let's next slide, next slide, next slide. Okay. So here is the slide that I wanted to get to. So with these seven networks and those health centers, there were 562 locations of care. And then we had 3,517 total respondents um, to the survey within those seven networks. So again, as I mentioned, it's physician-led really at the, at the Arch Collaborative. We included everybody in this survey. So you'll see on the next slide, I think, the different types of groupings we had. So allied health is what class, classes term. So we included all of the nursing staff, medical assistants, phlebotomists, uh, dentists, uh, behavioral health um, individuals, whoever's in the behavioral health team, um, whereas class really was focused on physicians, we really ex were able to expand their idea of who's working in a health center. And they unfortunately just lumped everybody in this group called the Allied Health. So of our group of the seven networks and the 3,517 respondents, 48% of them were in that grouping of an Allied Health. 19% were physician, 16% were advanced uh, practice providers, which would include um, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, um, certified nurse midwives, um, and then the nursing group was pretty broad also. So that's the breakdown of that larger um, seven networks of 3,500 different respondents within our FQHC group. On the next slide, so here is where you can see, again, this is the larger group, it's not just us at Health Choice Network. So this is all seven of those groups, but it'll, it'll give some perspective when we break it down into just our networks data. So this net EHR experience comes up to a score. There's all kinds of different questions that go into making up this kind of, the score that they rank um, here. And the score, I think it's from zero to 40, as you can, as you can see here in terms of their overall experience being positive or negative. And you can see here on the next slide that breakdown again of who um, is uh, more or less satisfied or dissatisfied. So the higher the score or closer to 40 would be a better net experience and the lower um, the score the worst experience. And whoever got that has that pointer, I love it. 
there we go. So as you can see in the score by group, it, it's broken down. And this is a whole series of questions that rolls up into this score. Unfortunately, our advanced practice providers and our physician groups are the least satisfied with whatever EMR they're on. And this, again, is across all seven networks. Um, so we'll, we'll look at our score in a, in a little bit. So let's move to the next slide and here, this is again by clinical background. So again, this is the community health center. So all of those people um, in that group for all seven networks, again, the physician and the, the providers um, are at the lowest um, level of their satisfaction with whatever EMR they're on. And we're on a bunch of different, different EMRs. So let's go to the next slide. So this is again, um, a little bit bro broken out into some of the groupings. It appears that the dentists are the most happy um, with their experience with whatever they're on. And again, it might be, you know, Dentrix is a pretty common one, but not everybody is on Dentrix. So this is, doesn't matter the EMR you're on or the dental tool you're on. And then behavioral health, same thing. Um, they're in between the dentist and the dental team and the medical team. But here, unfortunately, our medical teams are hurting. They are not happy and this is across all seven networks so it's not just us at, at health choice network it is uh unfortunately the community health center medical teams are very unhappy with the tool they have and doesn't matter what emr we're on because we'll see in a few slides we're on a whole bunch of different emrs i think it was like 20 different emrs so let's go to the next slide and here we go. This is an example of all of the different EMRs and that go rolls into that 3,517 respondents. So if we look at credible, which is the behavioral health, the numbers here are not big. So you look at the N of five. So it's hard to make any statistical um, interpretation. That's just five people were responding there. But you can, when the numbers are larger, if we go down and look at Dentrix, um, there's 154 people there. The Athena one is above that. Athena one, there's 70, I'm sorry, 370 people across all those networks. Remember there's um, Health Choice Network is many of us are on, on Intergy for the medical and then Credible and, and, and Dentrix for the other for oral health. But then Intergy is on there also. So we had 346 individuals who are on Intergy and their Net experience is 17.9, so not so not so great. So we've got some work to do um, here, and this shows um, that we can improve the experience of our users today. And if or when we're moving to a different EMR, we definitely want to do some things, um, meaning the end user training and specifically the personalization of each user on whatever EMR they're on must be done. So if we move to the next slide here, it's another um, breakdown of the different um, EMRs and oral health uh, products. So Athena Practice and Athena One are actually, look at that, they're two opposite ends of this. They're two different EMRs owned by the same company. So Athena Practice is actually, um, it was called GE Centricity in the past um, and it was purchased uh, by Athena and they just rebranded it Athena Practice where they've had the legacy Athena One product, which providers really do like. However, many health centers that are on Athena One do have some struggles with pulling out some data and quality reports and then um, billing is a problem. So we're in there in our Intergy for those of us who are on Intergy and, and Dentrix um, and Epic is, you know, is, is up there too. So this is just, again, um, do the respondents feel that their EMR is reliable? And you can go into the, the actual question and look at the, the questions later. So let's go to the next slide. Again, this is just another depiction of those 3,517 respondents. So that's why it's called the CHC or Community Health Center 20, which is, we did this survey last year in 2020. So that's why they class identified our carve out of this larger um, arch collaborative as we're the community health center group and the year was 2020. So here is just some um, um, comparisons among um, uh, other clinicians. And you, so you'll see it's a header of different questions. This is not actually the question, but it's getting at internal integration, 
functionality, reliability, patient safety, quality care, easy to learn, analytics, efficiency, the response time, and then extra external integration. And you'll see for the whole, this compares to the larger Arch Collaborative survey of, of clinicians. Remember, our group has many different types of, um, of roles at the Community Health Center, but it's mostly comparing in the larger group to physicians at academic centers. And so you can see where our um, dot is, the orange color dot, and then where the collaborative uh, median and the highest and lowest percentages in other organizations and where we fall as compared to them. So again, there's a lot of data here um, and, and, in, and you can look at this at, at your own time. And there's a lot of slides here. So let's move to the next slide. These slides, I'm not gonna go um, into in too much depth right here, but again, this is the larger group um, of federally qualified community health centers in the group. So that's why it's a CHC 20. And these are the different questions that go into that net EHR experience. So let's move forward to the next slide. Again, this is um, more of the scores of that larger group. Let's go forward into the next slide. And let's go one, keep going. We're gonna go now, keep going. We're gonna go to the slide. Okay, let, let, this is a one here because we'll talk about this in a minute. Um, this is also called the Medical Clinician's Wellness Dashboard. So it has some information on burnout. And as you know, we, we here at HCN and our quality team is often trying to talk about bringing the joy back in practice or to provide help with provider burnout. And some of that is, and we'll see in some future slides, is that the electronic medical record or the tool that we're using might be contributing to some of this burnout. So here we're starting to get at some of those burnout questions. We'll look at it in some uh, future slides, but this is the larger group, not HCN only. So let's move forward to the next slide. So now we're gonna get into our experience here at Health Choice Network, not the individual health center level, but it is at the net Health Choice Network 20. So that's why this data set is a carve out a smaller group of that larger um, FQHC group and a much smaller carve out of the larger hundreds of thousands of clinicians that are in the ARCH Collaborative. So here you can see in the Health Choice Network 20 data set, the numbers of respondents that are on different products. So you see again that Credible is five, there's an, uh, um, Dentrix at 52, Athena one, there's 82 people that responded on that. And then you go down to Intergy, there's 342 people that responded there. And you'll see their net experience here. So if you take a look at that group of uh, the Intergy users at 18.6, um, again, we've got a lot of work to do, or we have a lot of, let's say, opportunity to improve the EHR experience of our users of Intergy. So let's move forward to the next slide. Here is that same comparison that we looked at earlier. And since this is the first time doing this survey for Health Choice Network, we broke out Intergy clinicians only. So we don't really have much to compare it to. So that's why the other organizations really are not on here. Um, but it is, we will be taking the survey again, either um, later this year, but more likely and hopefully next year. And we'll have then more data points um, to compare. And these, these are all of the clinicians in the class collaborative using Intergy. So if you're the, in the Athena One group, you're, you're not in this slide. So let's go to the next slide, and that was clinicians only. So now we're breaking this down even a little bit further into, I think this group is gonna be the physicians only. So we broke out the medical doctors who are either MDs, DOs, residents, and then we and the dentists are in this group also. And the next group is the advanced practice providers. Um, so here you can see the net EHR experience for this group of the physician that we call the physician group um, is 12.7. So and those are the different 
categories that go in again to that net EHR experience, uh, we got some work to do. And um, and if there's anybody who has any questions, please put them in. The, I know I'm just um, rambling away here, but if there are questions, put them in the chat. I can stop and we can take questions. I don't mind to be interrupted. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I think here we're gonna see uh, the advanced practice providers. Again, it's um, a, a smaller group, so there's only 95 respondents here. But again, the net EHR experience um, is not so not so good. So it's 18.1 here. So again, with the physician assistants, nurse practitioners, I think the, and the certified nurse midwives are all in this group if they responded. Um, we're gonna, um, you know, as, as I said, we're gonna have now data points to compare if we either do work on optimization, personalization, or ongoing training, or even switch different EMRs. So let's move to the next slide. Again, so this is um, a, a, a different questions here, as you can see. This is, again, we're going back to Health Choice Networks group of physicians only. So this is the dentists, the residents, and the MDs and DOs. So this included in their experience there, was their initial training sufficient? Is there sufficient ongoing training? Are they using personalizations? Does the organization deliver well? Does the vendor deliver well? And has the user has learned the system well? A couple of points I would look at here, the user personalizations at 43%. We really have an opportunity to do some ongoing training and personalization um, with users, clinicians, specifically on this slide, and having them personalize their use of whatever EMR they're on right now today. And if you're in one of those health centers in wave one or two, that you're gonna be moving to Epic over the next 12 months or so, you definitely wanna make sure that personalization is part of the expectation of a user getting trained on Epic. So let's move forward to the next slide. And I think we're gonna have the advanced practice providers here. So same questions. Um, it's the net EHR experience and this, the same questions. Initial training, was that sufficient? Ongoing training, is that sufficient? Again, using the personalizations. Is the organization delivering? Is the vendor delivering? And has the user um, learned the system well? So we have some opportunities here as well. So let's move to the next slide. And here, this is the, again, we talked about that, that wellness dashboard. Again, it's broken out for Health Choice Network only, and it's broken into the physician group. So here, talking about burning out um, and, and having um, EHR expertise. Um, and if they're charting less than five hours a week at home, that again goes into factoring of burnout or not. And then 50% or more of their charts are closed that same day, meaning you're able to get your work done in real time, um, that 50%, we'd really, really like to work to get that number up. I'm a practicing physician, and I push myself every time I'm, I see patients just one day a week right now. Um, but in the past, when I, you know, when I saw patients maybe three or four days a week, um, I always tried to get as a goal charting done in real time. I know it takes a lot of upfront time, but you cannot remember what a physical exam look like on a foot if you're charting a week later or even 24 hours later. So you really wanna do real time charting um, and we wanna make that um, as efficient as possible. So if we move to the next slide, we'll see the same breakout for the group of advanced practice providers. Again, uh, some real opportunity here. So let's move to the next slide. This again is part of that EHR experience but broken down into the personalization and adopting whatever EMR you're on, has that physician, or and we'll look at the APP group next, did they actually pers use personalized templates, the personalized macros? Um, are they using personalized order sets and lists and filters, views, sorting and shortcuts? So these are all functionalities that we would like to have from an electronic medical record and then make sure that we're using that personalized. So it doesn't have to be the whole organization, but you could have groups that let's say all of the family medicine providers might be using a certain group of order sets or lists or shortcuts. You wanna share those, but everyone should be using 
some of these personalizations, but they don't have to be all personally um, created. You can, you can do this as groups. So let's move to the next slide and you'll see the same questions broken into the advanced practice providers. So again, that same group, 95 individuals here. And again, we've got some opportunity for improvements here. Doesn't matter what EMR you're on, we can, we can really do some work here. So let's move to the next slide. And this gets into that wellness. And they had, in the class survey um, that we took last fall, and if you were one of them, you'll remember, um, we had some burnout questions. So there are three burnout questions, and we'll look at the results. But I wanna just read through these questions first, these three questions, and then we'll look at the results of our provider groups. So using your own definition of burnout, so that could be anything. We didn't want to define what that meant. The, the respondent to the survey selected one of the answers below. So either A, I enjoy my work, and I have no symptoms of burnout, however that person defines it. Or B, I'm under stress and don't usually have as much energy as I did, but I don't feel burned out. Or C, I am definitely burning out and have one or more symptoms of burnout. And they gave the examples of emotional exhaustion. Or D, the symptoms of burnout that I'm experiencing won't go away. I think about work frustration a lot. And then E, I feel completely burned out and I am at a point where I might need to seek help. So those are the answers to this first burnout question. So let's go to the second question, number two. And this is the same thing. What are the primary contributors to your feelings of burnout. Here people can check any that apply. So they might have all, or they might just have one. So, and then question number three um, is similar. It has the same responses as question one, but we, we wanted to know whether it changed between using your definition of burnout, rate your level of burnout during the following period. So one was before the COVID outbreak, and then one was obviously since we did this in the fall, of 2020, we were still in the middle of COVID, unfortunately. How would you respond to the same responses during that COVID period, which was um, during this was uh, taken during September and October of last fall? So now let's move forward to the next slide and see some of these responses. So here we broke this out again. So this is um, Health Choice Networks group alone, uh, and this is just the physician group. And here we had 123 people who were able to answer these questions. I know the numbers are a little bit off, but there were three top contributors for burnout for physicians. And number one was after hours workload. That generally means um, what some people call pajama time or where you're documenting in the EMR from home. We want to try to avoid that. However, we need to, we need to do that. And by number two, is EHR other IT tools hurt my efficiency? We have got to improve um, the EMR, however it is from the vendor, and then and make sure that the users feel that it is not hurting their efficiency. And then for physicians, they felt that there were too many bureaucratic tasks. And that means probably in documenting. So they might have felt like they're doing things the things that, I mean, if you remember the program of meaningful use or promoting interoperability, there were some things in there that I think clinicians felt, why am I doing this? It doesn't really seem that I need to do this. Or I'm doing it for some billing aspect or something. Really, clinicians want to be clinicians and they don't want to spend too much time having to document um, that stuff. So hopefully um, with the new, and this is just a plug off this, off this <laughs> conversation here, you know, there have been some new um, coding uh, that went into effect this year, and we'll probably talk more about that in a future QTech meeting, which should make the providers coding and documenting a lot easier before you had to you know, have all kinds of calculations of how many things in the HPI, how many review of systems, how many physical exam findings. Those things have all changed. Um, so we'll talk about that in the future. On the next slide, we broke it out into our advanced practice providers. So same questions. Um, and what are their top three contributors for burnout? It's exactly the same. The first two are exactly the same. After hours workload, number two was the EHR, other IT tools hurt my efficiency. It was that third one where the advanced practice providers felt that they were working too many hours. 
uh, that came into their uh, burnout. And you can see the breakdown there. If they're under stress, no burnout, definitely burned out. Symptoms of burnout are completely burned out, both on this one and the, and the previous slide of where they responded. We do not want, obviously, people burning out here. We want to have uh, build um, resiliency and bring joy back to practice. And so that's why the QTEC grant actually exists, remember, to improve the patient provider experience. So let's move to the next slide. This is a schematic of those burnout questions. It's a little bit busy, I understand. But here you can see um, in the gray, there's been no change uh, before COVID or during COVID. Because remember, we asked this question twice. And then in the yellow, 43% said their level of burnout, however they defined it, has increased during this period. And then 4% of them are in the blue, decrease. I don't know, we gotta go talk to those 23 people who think that COVID make it, made it easier, but who knows? It could have been telehealth, um, you know, or me meaning they can work from home and didn't have much of a commute time. So there's other things that go into people's sense of burnout. So let's move to the next slide. And here are some kind of take home points um, that, that class felt that they found in our data that they gave to us. So this was a HCN's um, take home points. This is really when class provided this, they felt um, that these were what they found for the overall community health centers. So first, community health centers should feel very optimistic about the future as the first score, this is our first set of, of scores, um, offers a baseline of overall satisfaction with low hanging fruit opportunities. Again, as was mentioned, you know, doing some of this personalization. Um, obviously, as I said here, the physicians and the advanced practice provider groups are the lowest scoring groups. And as many of you know, this is our revenue generators at the at, in the community health center. So we have to have physicians and providers to see patients to bill, to make money, to pay for our care teams, to care, pay for our, our lights. Um, so we need to change um, the scoring. And really we need to change that by improving our um, uh, uh, knowledge um, and efficiency on whatever EMR we're on. So we're not, I'm not talking about everyone's got to switch EMRs. Like if you are switching EMR, there's some things that you can do before you switch to EMR. And if you're not switching EMRs, there's definitely some things we can, we can do also. And then the third bullet point is significant opportunity exists around those pillars, supporting, again, what I mentioned starting off is that successful um, user. So um, let's move to the next slide here. And again, this is the take home point. So this is the one side that if you wanna pull something out of this slide deck, copy and or clip and paste this into another presentation. All of that goes into this one slide. We wanna make sure that we have strong user mastery of whatever EMR we're on. So I'm you know, speaking EMR agnostic here. So if we're on Greenways Intergy, we wanna make sure that we're using it to the best we can. And there's opportunities for improvement there. We wanna make sure um, that the tool that we're using meets our unique needs. And we want to make sure that our staff here, we're talking mostly about our, you know, our provider staff, feel that they have a shared ownership. So as you've heard many of our colleagues here at HealthRights Network talk about, you know, this, this Epic conversion to a new EMR called Epic, it is not an IT project. It is a clinical project. And I'm going to repeat it over and over. This is a clinical project. Yes, it's an IT tool, but it is a clinical project and the clinicians must own it and we and we as the physicians and clinicians must feel that we're owning it and then with that we'll have successful users let's move to the next slide so here are also some take-home points <clears throat> as i'm losing my voice here so training is so important and training has the biggest impact on burnout um, and on clinician efficiency. We oftentimes, you know, hire new clinicians, we do a little onboarding, and we throw them out there on the floor and say, good luck. We gotta not do that at all. There are three rights to training, so the right number of hours. We need the right trainer 
who is training the person. And we need the right location. And any effort to train will have an impact, although maximizing training efforts will have a much larger impact. Clinicians uh, prefer one-on-one -on -one training rather than um, in a large groups. Um, again, this is from the take home points from, from class. So this is just very generalization. Um, we need to modify it, obviously, for our, our own community health center and our own uh, group of providers at our own health center. Um, and training, this is, this is coming out loud and clear, um, training is most effective if it's self-requested by the clinician. So if people are, and this is different than just onboarding training, but if we're doing optimization training, ongoing training, we really want to give an avenue for clinicians to say, I really would like um, some more training um, and, and make that opportunity um, available to people. And then training really should be broken up into site bite-sized uh, pieces. So it might be 15 minutes or 30 minutes. It is rarely, I know we have to do it at you know, new, new employee training, we have to kind of do it in you know, larger blocks of time. But maybe the ongoing training is you know, in 15, 30, 20 minute uh, blocks of time, not those long eight hour blocks of time. And again, these are generalizations. There's a lot of specifics that can go into this. So let's move to the next slide. Okay, so now that my voice is near um, dry, and I'm sure I'm starting to crack up, um, we do have the virtual around the room. And this is where we wanna hear from you. So we would really like to hear, um, at any, and we're gonna open up the, the audio lines, and I think Stephanie Smith or Stephanie Martinez will help us with that. So if you don't wanna talk, you can put it in the chat. We really would like to hear your voice um, in this virtual around the room. We have two questions that we'd like people to answer. Um, what does your EMR training um, look like for onboarding a new clinician? So let's say you hire a family medicine physician, they're starting next week on Monday. They walk into the office and probably go to HR first. But what does the actual amount of um, onboarding for the EMR look like? And then and who does that training? Um, how many hours is it? In what setting? Over what amount of time? And then what does the ongoing optimization look like for clinicians? So let's say you're a clinician who's there 30, 60, 90 days, or maybe even a year, two years. There's constant upgrades. What does that look like? And so I'm going to be quiet and probably go on mute here. And I would love others to unmute themselves and speak up. So, so the lines are unmuted, Dr. Long, but we do have one question in the chat for you. They're asking if the results are available by health center. So, um, yes, they are. Um, and we can give them to individual health centers. Some of them are really small. And that's correct, right, Stephanie? You better keep me honest here. Yes. We, yeah. we have it broken out. Yeah. So some of the health centers, the numbers are really small, so they might deviate a little bit from here. And we did not break it into this thing. So yes, we can give the raw data to the health centers. And the lines are unmuted, Steph, so I'm not sure if you wanted to take it from here. Sure thing. We can give everyone a few seconds if they'd like to ask um, or answer, I should say, the questions for the around the virtual room that were posed by Dr. Long. And I'm looking at the chat again, and I'm seeing um, some folks are actually participating in the around the virtual room using the chat. So um, we have one representative from Jesse Trice, Chantal, who's sharing for onboarding new providers, two days of EMR in training in a conference room, then one to two weeks of partnering with an established provider before they are on their own. And as of right now, there's um, little ongoing training. So that's been shared in the chat. Okay, more people can either uh, put your response in the chat or we'd love to hear from you. And I see everyone's name, so I don't want to yet start calling out names, but I see everyone's name who is logged in here. 
And I know many of you have some great information to share. So we do have another comment in the chat as well. Um, speaking of from their health center perspective that from family care, they know that there's a need right now to address this and that staffing is a concern they're trying to work through. So they're interested in knowing what other team members are doing for training at the other health centers. Great question. Hi, Dr. Long. Yes. Hi, this is Anna Ferguson from Camilla's Health Concern. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for us, uh, for onboarding of our new providers, we normally rely on the modules um, through our IT department and HCN. Um, normally, we, in most cases, we try to have like a super, super user doctor, if you will, um, that will also spend an extended amount of time with our new provider. So besides the modules, then we have about another week where they're shadowing another provider who's more savvy in the system. So that's what we do for our, our new uh, staff that's coming on board for EHR. That is great. And I appreciate you sharing that information. Good afternoon, Dr. Long. This is Alex Dueso from BCOM, Broward Community Family Health Center. Yes. How you doing? So uh, we revamped our uh, training process because uh, we, uh, during our exit interviews with the providers who would exit the company, they, their, their biggest complaint was really training. And so um, we completely restructured our onboarding process. And we incorporated uh, HCN to train for three days. And uh, I got to tell you, that coupled along with the CBTs uh, that uh, Greenway offers, um, it's it's been a, a game changer for us because uh, that one-on-one, -on -one, like, like you mentioned on one of your slides there, that it, it just makes a difference. They're, they're able to talk to the trainer and, and kind of have their own personalized training session for, for their uh, specialty. So, uh, you know, we did that and, and then we uh, had the, the provider spend a week shadowing another provider. Uh, and then uh, two weeks after we have uh, the training, the ACN trainers contact the providers to have a follow-up session. So, you know, we still got to do some improvements, but that that process there, getting ACN involved in the training has, has uh, been a big difference for us. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, appreciate that. Sure. This is Allison from Comwell. We're very similar. Um, we do the computer-based trainings. We have the shadowing with the provider. The other thing that we do is after they've shadowed with the provider and done the computer-based trainings, then we have um, our, one of our clinical systems analysts spend the first day with the patient and we set up their schedule to do like one patient, uh, it, you know, depending on their skill set, if they um, uh, feel comfortable they may do one to two per hour, one to two in the morning, and then we have the clinical system analysts right there with them trying to help them through the process, and then we increase their schedule up. We also um, try to do look at their documentation to see with the quality measures to see if they're having any trouble checking the correct boxes. And um, the hardest thing we see is um, combining referrals, like they'll do a referral if it's a diabetic, a lot of times that's a trouble thing and it drives the referral specialist crazy. They may do an ophthalmology and something else, but um, having that contact regularly and then after they get through that, the, the clinical systems analyst Skypes the provider at least uh, once a week just to do a check-in. And if they need more assistance, they'll go back and spend some additional time. That is great. Well, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Stephanie, because I need to jump to another meeting, but I appreciate everyone's time of listening to this. And we will, one of the take home points will be send out um, some hard data. <laughs> so thank you all. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Dr. Long, for sharing this data and insight with everyone during QTech today. And if you'd like, you can also go ahead and put 
Continue to respond to the around the virtual room questions if you'd like in the chat box, and we'll be collecting those um, different responses and different questions that you may have in reference to that. So I think what we can do is go ahead and um, just briefly talk about the ARCH Collaborative Guidebook. That is a resource that is available to you all within the slides for you to download and take a look. ARCH Collaborative has taken a lot of that insight collected through that survey effort and broken down the different things to consider as best practices or leading practices as you think about how you can improve EHR satisfaction with your clinicians and your health center staff. So there's a lot of amazing resources built in within this document um, and then we're broken down as well in the following slides, which you all can take a look at at your leisure. If we can, we can actually go ahead and pass the floor um, back to our colleague, Fred Ira, who can cover some of the different badges and opportunities that are available within um, HRSA that was just recently announced. So the QIA efforts, as you know, the QIA awards, I should say, had done some significant changes and now they've been um, rebranded and renamed by HRSA. So I'm actually gonna pass the floor to my colleague, Fred Ira, who's gonna talk to us a little bit more about those badges, um, the different designations and more information around that. So Fred, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fred Ira, like Stephanie said, and I am the Practice Transformation Coach here at Health Choice Network. And I've been asked to speak to you with regards to uh, the recent webinar that was just released by HRSA on the Community Health Quality Recognition Badges and other funding opportunities. Okay, so the Community Health Quality Recognition Badges, which is a mouthful, but it's known as Checker, so that's a lot easier to say. So these badges, the checker badges, recognize health center program awardees and lookalikes that have made notable quality improvement achievements in the areas of access, quality, health equity, and health information technology for the most recent UDS reporting period. In addition, COVID-19 badges were introduced to recognize health centers' contributions to the public health emergency response in the areas of data collection, testing, and vaccinations. So, improving quality of care, that recognizes health centers that improve quality of care in two subcategories. We have the national quality leaders, which represent health centers that meet or exceed national benchmarks for one or more of the clinical quality measures. The CQMs, groups that promote behavioral health, diabetes health, and heart health. Recipients, recipients are limited to the top one to 2% of the health centers. The next subgroup is the health center quality leaders, and those are uh, health centers that have achieved the best overall clinical quality measure performance among all the health, other health centers. They are recognized in the following tiers, gold, which is the top 10%, the silver, which is uh, between 11 and 20%, and then bronze, which is in the top 21 to 30%. The next badge, is the Access Enhancer Badge, and that uh, badge is for health centers that are recognizing health centers that increase the total number of patients they serve and the number of patients who receive at least one comprehensive service, which is uh, a mental health, substance abuse, vision, dental, and or enabling services by at least 5%. Next slide, please. The next badge that uh, HRSA has is the Health Disparities Reducer. And this recognizes uh, health centers that meet or exceed healthy people 20 or healthy people goals in the areas of low birth weight, hypertension, or uncontrolled diabetes for at least one racial ethnic minority group, and demonstrate at least a 10% improvement in the in the areas of low birth weight, hypertension, or uncontrolled diabetes for at least one racial ethnic group. The next uh, badge is Advancing Health Information Technology for Quality. And that recognizes health centers that meet all criteria to optimize HIT services that advance telehealth, patient engagement, interoperability, and collection of social determinants of health to increase access to care and advance quality of care. Next slide, please. The next badge is the Patient Center Medical Home Badge. And this recognizes health centers with PCMH recognition in one or more of the, their delivery sites. 
Now, the new badges for 2021 in response to the uh, COVID-19 outbreak are the COVID-19 checker badges. And there's actually three of these badges. And the first one is the COVID-19 data reporter. And that recognizes the health centers as supported data for public health emergencies with a response rates of 90% or more to the weekly Healthy Center COVID-19 survey from April 10th, 2020 through July 2nd, 2021. The next badge was the COVID-19 testing, and that recognizes health centers that tested more than 50% of their 2020 reported UDS patient population from April 10th, 2020 to July 2nd, 2021, and have a response rate of at least 50% to the weekly health center COVID-19 survey. The last uh, COVID-19 checker badge is the COVID-19 vaccination badge, which recognizes health centers that administered vaccines to more than 70% of their 2020 reported UDS patient population from April 10th through July 2nd, 2021, and have a response rate of at least 50% to the weekly health center COVID-19 survey. Next slide, please. So those are all the badges that uh, HRSA released for 2020 UDS reporting. Now, what does that mean for all of, for HCN and all of our HCN um, QTech uh, health centers? It means that we received 90, a total of 99 badges for all of the HCN QTech health centers. Um, and even more, we had two health centers that received six badges, two health centers that received five badges, seven health centers that received four badges. And I will say I, did, I didn't include it here, but all of the health centers that are on this call and all of the health centers that are included in the QTech grant received at least one badge. So I will pause here for a round of applause for everybody. Great job. Great job to everybody. Uh, this slide right here, yes, thank you. This slide right here, it actually breaks down how many of our health centers, our HCN health centers received the National Quality Leader. We actually had three of them. How many of our health centers, we had seven, uh, fell into that health, cent health center quality leader gold? Six of them fell into the silver, three of them fell into the bronze. So that means that, what is that, 13, 16 of our health centers fell into the top 30% of all community health, community health centers. So that's fantastic. To, uh, quality leaders there. Next slide, please. Uh, four of our health centers received the Accents, Access Enhancer Badge. Three of them received the Health Disparities Reducer. 20 of them received the Advancing Health Information Technology, uh, HIT for quality. 12, 12 of our health centers received the COVID-19 data reporter, where seven received the COVID-19 testing. One of them actually received the COVID-19 vaccination. And then the last badge that was there is 33 of our health centers uh, received the PCMH badge, which again, that's a great job there. So what does that mean? for uh, going forward for 2021. So we all know that the QIA awards have, like Stephanie mentioned at the beginning, they've changed completely. Before uh, we used to receive funding and awards based off, of the inf uh, based off of the UDS reporting that we submitted. That is no longer the case. We've been talking about that for over a year, going on two years now that this was gonna be changing. Funding is changing and this is straight from HRSA. The checker badges are not associated with supplemental funding. Our new quality improvement fund will leverage grants, prize challenges, and pay for performance opportunities with the aim to test, innovate, and collect insights and lessons to learn. So what that means is HERSA is now giving out money upfront through a process of the, that you have to apply for grants. So they're giving you money upfront for, to uh, enhance quality improvement activities. So, there are uh, opportunities that have already come out. There are opportunities that are active right now that you can go in and look. And there's gonna be opportunities that are gonna be coming down the line, down the pipe. We at HCN, we're gonna do everything we can to help communicate as, as much as we can uh, that information to you guys in forums like this and other forums that we have as well. But next slide, please. What we need for you guys to do, somebody at your health center, actually multiple people at your health center, need to go on to these two links here, which you can go into. The first one kind of tells you uh, and, and it kind of goes through the process of how you can apply for these grants, 
what information you need to provide, what do you have to do to receive that funding. The second one, the listserv link, is where you can go in and actually sign up for the emails and newsletters that, that um, they display that information on those NOFO uh, funding opportunities that they're going to have. Um, now, I am going to share my screen real quick here because I wanna kind of show you, uh, we're gonna put a link in the chat that actually has the breakdown of the checker badge system, okay? So I want to, hold on here. Let me get this up. Hold on a second. There it is, okay. So let me see if I can share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. And we see the GoToWebinar site. Oh, wrong screen. Perfect. We can now okay. see your screen perfectly. And I just wanted to make an announcement that the link was provided in the chat for everyone to also access the same information and follow along as you do your demo. So this is the link that has all of the UDS information. It's data.hersa.gov and it has, this is the program uniform data system data overview. So when you go into this, when you click on this link, you could actually go through and see all of your UDS data that was uh, submitted. Oh. You could change the your whatever state that you are in. Um, I'm actually just in the state of Florida. I'm going to look at a random. We're just going to click onto a random um, um, health center here. When you click on the health center, when you find your particular health center, you will see all of the badges uh, that you have earned that the health center has earned for reporting year of 2020. If you don't already have this information already. Also, it has all of your UDS data. You can click through these different tabs here, patient characteristics, services, the clinical data, cost data, et cetera. All here is here, and it actually has it for the last five years of reporting data. So you can go in there and look at all of this. This is a wonderful resource to have. This has all of the, the, the information that was submitted to UDS. Like I said, you can go in here and change the state if you're not in the state of Florida. I know we're in multiple states across the country, so go in there. And then once you're into the state, you can actually scroll here and look at all the, the uh, health centers in that state and click on your respective uh, health center. And then you'll have all of your uh, badges and all of your UDS data. I will open the floor if anybody has any questions, if any need any other information. I don't know if there's anything in the chat. I'm taking a look at the chat right now and I do not see any questions within the chat. We'll give folks some seconds to go ahead and unmute their lines if they would like to ask a question verbally. I see a question in the chat, chat and it's where is listserv and that is actually in the presentation. The link itself, uh, we can put it in the chat as well, I, I suppose. Um, let me sure thing. Right yeah. We... I think also Thank it's hyperlinked, right, Steph? It's hyperlinked yes, in the hyperlinked. committee slides. It's on yes. the handout section panel of the webinar. Thank you, Steph. Yeah, it's also within the slides as well. Great point there. Well, hearing no other questions, I'm gonna go ahead and proceed with closing us out for this afternoon's QTech committee meeting. We have a few action items listed here for you all. So one of which of course is submitting your health center spotlight. We are always welcome to hearing your health center's perspective on how you've approached different quality improvement projects or maybe EHR you know, satisfaction like Dr. Long was talking about. Anything related to our QTEC goals, grants and objectives, we would love to welcome you to share some insight with everyone relating to that. In addition to that, as Fred mentioned, please make sure that you are registered for those listservs from HRSA so that you are able to keep a pulse on those upcoming quality improvement fund opportunities. And then, of course, as we go to the next couple of slides, we have 
we do have some key upcoming events that will be taking place. So on the next slide, we have just a QR code here for our Health Center Spotlight. Feel free to scan this QR code if you'd like to submit your CHC Spotlight using the form. Um, you can always, of course, reach out with, via email to us and we would also be happy to have you join that way as well. If we proceed to the next slide, we do have some upcoming events we do wanna make you aware of, one of which is our Virtual Clinical Leaders Mentorship Office Hours. This is an opportunity where Dr. Tim Long and Dr. Waria Usman, both Chief Clinical Officers from Health Choice Network and Align Chicago, come together and answer some key questions you might have within your role as a clinical leader. On the next slide, we have a reference to our virtual educational conference. Please register if you have not done so already. There are some key different dates and items here listed for you to check out the schedule and agenda and schedule that accordingly with your staff. It is free of cost to all of our members, so thank you. On the next slide, we have our last reference here for our clinical leaders workshop. This workshop is an opportunity again to collaborate with other emerging or seasoned clinical leaders and gain some other insight and things you need to know in that capacity. So it's going to be on site and also a virtual option is available for that three day event. So we look forward to having you register if you haven't done so already. And I believe that's the last slide. So thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon for QTech. We look forward to hearing from you all next month. Take care and have a great rest of your day.